Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 18. I invite you, as I read these words, to listen to the words of this story, knowing that we often do with the Easter narrative that which we do with the Christmas narrative and hold together all of the gospel accounts in one story. But let's listen for John's artistry in this text as we hear the word for today. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen wrappings, but was rolled up and set aside in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she bent over to look into the tomb, she wept. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, Mary said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. But Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then Jesus said, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Living God, you draw near to us. Even when we go looking for what's living among the dead. Even when we grieve. Even when we are overcome with despair. You are with us always. We pray that by your grace, you will open our senses, our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to you, to your presence with us here and your word to us now, so that we, like Mary, may be equipped and emboldened to live into the good news 
of the gospel. Jesus, this we ask in your holy name, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So for two weeks in March of 2007, there was an odd scene that unfolded as Swiss artist Felice Varini and his team created a massive work of public art. Artists and mountain climbers painted patches of yellow onto working locks and gates and the outer sea wall at Cardiff Bay in Wales. All of these patches of yellow came together to form three perfect ellipses, three circles. However, there was only one spot where the painting could be seen in its entirety. One had to find the spot on the ground marked with a white cross painted on the stone. And only from here did the image take shape. Now, I don't know how long it took John to draft this gospel. Did it take him a year or more like it took the Swiss artist? How much planning or outlining or rewriting may he have done before the words that we just heard today became a part of the canon of our faith? By all rights, John is an artist himself. And anyone who would like to sit down and talk more about the artistry of his gospel, give me a call because I could go on about it, but I'll just tell you these things for now. John narrates the story of Christ's resurrection by pointing out a sequence of odd details before one before the other, before any one of Jesus' disciples can recognize the risen Lord. John plays with light and location. This motif of Mary arriving before the break of day is no mistake. It is an intentional detail John worked into his text. The proximity of each of the disciples to the tomb itself, an intentional stroke of his pen. And then John gives us some very strange details in this story. Races. Three races unfold at the entrance to Christ's tomb. And John tells this unexpected story that plays out in the stuff of every day through disciples chasing one after the other to see who would get somewhere first, to rolled up grave clothes that weren't where they should have been, to human tears and more tears. Now, with each movement and phrase and assumption and priority, John raises the question for the story's characters, but also for us today over and over again, asking, what do you see? Now, we have heard these details before, and like I said, we often combine these details with those shared in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels. But in reality, their accounts of the empty tomb are quite different. The primary constant is Mary. Mary, we are told, arrives at Jesus' tomb while it is still dark. And in this gospel, she arrives alone and empty-handed. When she sees that the shape of the stone has been rolled away, she takes off in the first race of the day, running to find disciples to tell this news. Her teacher or Lord had been stolen, as if his execution wasn't enough to rid the world of him. And so Mary runs. She runs for help. She runs because she cannot think of anything else to do. She runs to find Jesus. 
And then we hear of the disciples who hop to their feet and run alongside her, learning that John, the beloved disciple is faster than Peter, but too nervous to enter the tomb until Peter goes in first. John goes into great detail to make sure that we know that, that Simon Peter and the beloved disciple were, were preoccupied with their own egotistic pursuits to do much more than notice and confirm what Mary had already told them. The tomb was empty. Yep, it was. They noticed the grave clothes lying there. And in a plot twist that begs more questions than answers, we hear that the beloved disciple believes, but we're never told what he believes. And although John lays out the story that he, as if he is sharing breaking news as it unfolds, piecing together the patchwork of this story in present, text, present tense language, that gives each detail a sense of immediacy we can feel. These two disciples, the two male disciples, leave this odd scene as quickly as they arrive. They go home, John tells us, leaving Mary and the empty tomb alone. So back to Mary. Mary lingers. She stops running in search or pursuit of the risen Christ. She stops running for help. She stays still and sobs. This is not how life was supposed to be. We tune in to see what she will do next and watch her sob and know there is nothing we can do to help her. We can palpably feel the questions swirling in her mind and can only add to them, holding our breath as she looks into the tomb, herself unsurprised to find angels sitting where Jesus' body should be, reaching out to comfort her, asking why she is crying. It is here, it is here at the place of death, in a moment of grief, where there is no easy answers to quiet any fears that the risen Christ shows up. It is here when everybody stops the busy work of doing and seeking and finding. It is here that Jesus shows up. Somehow he's changed, but John reminds us that he is truly a good shepherd, for his, it is his distinct and recognizable voice as he speaks Mary's name that allows her to recognize her teacher and Lord, who then tells her and her alone to go and tell others that she has seen her risen Lord. Jesus is alive. This is her news to share. This next paragraph in my sermon for today is a bit of a parenthetical notation and a promise for another sermon where I point out what should be obvious to us by now, but for many is not, which is that part where God reveals the resurrection to a woman and to a woman alone. And then Christ commissions her to be the bearer of the most important news in human history. Lest the church of 2023 or the church of which Peter was appointed its head wonder, Jesus did have female disciples. They did call him rabbi or teacher, a title that indicates that Jesus was teaching and equipping and sending women as his own. And they were commissioned to ministry, singularly entrusted with the most pivotal information about who Jesus was and who he is for us. Especially within God's, God, John's gospel, a woman once more is the bearer of good news. 
But that's just a sidebar. John reminds us as we join Mary outside this empty tomb that there is a truth that is often undiscernible to the naked eye. There is a truth that will not look like anything we have seen before. There is a truth that will in fact defy our expectations, especially if we, like Mary, set out to find the living among the dead. There is a truth that John helps us see that even when bad has turned to worse, that even when everything we have loved or trusted or seems now to be lost, the story has not ended there. John shows us another way. John shows us that there is good news to come. John writes of a Messiah who enters into humanity, who does not run from the mess of the human situation, but into it, even when doing so would cause God to suffer too. That same Jesus that watched feet, that same Jesus that stopped a woman from being stoned on the side of the road, that same Jesus that touched blind eyes, and drank water poured by a Samaritan woman at a well, switches things up for all of us again. God changes the terms for humanity, for all of creation. There is now triumph for the one who suffered injustice. There is love where there had been hate. There is life where there had been death. There is reunion when all hope had been lost. In the risen Christ, we are reminded that the story continues with God. Things don't have to be the way they've always been. We do not need to succumb to the evils and horrors of our day, those stories that make us turn off the news at night before young ears can hear what's happening in the world. Things do not have to be how we have expected them to be. Death does not mean an ending. Hate does not need to be a powerful force that cannot be overcome to which we submit. Rather, in Christ, there is possibility for something new. There is the ending of oppression. There is the breaking of all that binds us. There is a new way to face one another and reality and even our God. There is a love that gives new life. There is a love that gives hope. See, John wants us to see that this is how God works. Now, we might not always be able to see it. We might not recognize evidence of God's hand playing out in our lives or in humanity. But John assures us that Christ is with us even when we don't know where to find him that Christ shows up in the most unexpected of places, that Christ goes before us always. John points out that God is a God who even comes to us in our grief, who holds all the questions that spiral in our hearts and minds and helps us figure out a way forward when there is no sure and certain path. God opens eyes and hearts by simply speaking our name. John reminds us that God in Christ cannot be confined or defined by the limits of this world or human expectation. And God today is still doing a new thing 
in the world God has made and redeemed. So I ask you today to consider your vantage point. What is your view from here? What is the lens through which you are experiencing life, the world, or even God? What is it that has set your expectations? What is it that has expanded or confined your ability to hope? Now, I don't know what your hearts hold, whether you come today carrying grief, whether you are filled with wonder, whether you are plagued with a tremendous amount of confusion about how God could be God when the world contains such messiness and cruelty and violence. I don't know if you're coming today wondering in whom you can place your trust when there are people and systems in this world that have not earned any of our trust. I don't know if you're bursting with joy, unable to contain your gratitude for life and new life abounding around and within you. I don't know if you have more questions than answers and are wondering what might come next. But I do know that there is no singular vantage point, whether physical or emotional or spiritual or literal, that you must occupy in order to encounter Christ. You don't need to be happy or sad or curious or certain. You don't need to be the fastest runner. You don't need to be the best or the worst. You don't need to be a particular gender or race or have earned a certain level of education. You just need to be you. As authentically as you can imagine, with a willingness to pause wherever you are and open your senses that you too might realize that God is in fact with us. Christ will keep on calling until you hear his voice. The picture painted in John's gospel is of a God who in Christ was victorious over death. The picture painted in John's gospel is of a God who is even clothed in victory, who stops and wipes human tears, who claims us as God's own, who gives a confused and stumbling humanity a purpose and a call. The resurrection of Christ is the source of our present and future hope. It is the force by which our present world can be transformed for the risen Christ breaks into our lives in surprising ways through moments of unmerited forgiveness, through astonishing understanding and breathtaking awe. And we too are called by the risen Christ to go out and give voice and name all that is possible in this life to notice and claim that love can heal wounds, correct injustice, and give new life. Not because we have followed all of the steps to a T, but because that is what God does. Friends, regardless of where we show up today, know that the message is ours to share. For in Christ, love conquers hate, hope conquers despair, and life conquers death. May we greet the dawn of this and every new day with the hope of our faith. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen.